for the Investing News Network. I'm Brian McGovern, and today we have a very special discussion about cannabis retail operations with two extraordinary guests. Joining me today is Trevor Fencott, President and CEO of Fire and Flower Holdings, a Canadian cannabis retailer from Toronto with stores across the country. Trevor, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Also with us today, David Ferris, VP of Sales and Marketing with Planet 13 Holdings, a cannabis retailer in Las Vegas, managing one of the biggest attractions in the cannabis retail space with your Las Vegas location. Thank you so much for your time as well, David. Yeah, thank you for having me. Both of your companies have been able to rapidly establish yourselves as premier retail names in the cannabis industry. Today, I'm hoping to discuss the critical role that both of you and your entities play in the industry and the way that brand appeal is connected with the retail market. David, why don't we start with you? And often the US has been described as the wild west of the cannabis industry. Uh, what are some of the ways that you have seen the evolution of consumer knowledge and interest when it comes to branded products? Yeah, so, you know, I've been with the company for almost six years now. And, you know, we've seen the, you know, in Nevada specifically, um, you know, the change from, you know, no legal market to medical market and now recreational market. Um, and, and now, you know, since the recreational has hit um, in the US and Nevada specifically um, as a state, it's, you know, it's the progression that we've seen over the past few years has, has been extraordinary. So uh, we've seen on the retail side, you know, the brand presence of, you know, products determine a lot of the sales and, you know, it's a huge part and, and product focused, um, you know, dispensaries, which we feel like we are um, brands are setting the tone and creating the customer buzz. Uh, we do a lot of collaborations from a brand perspective um, in the market. We're doing constant new launches and drops and, you know, collaborations, exclusives. And we're really starting to mirror uh, consumer goods in other markets. Um, we're seeing the quality um, rise uh, in a huge way. Uh, but the branding component of packaging of, of you know, how that that brand gets advertised into the market is is again going head to head with you know mature markets that have been you know been around for for hundreds of years and so um, I think right now we're at the the tipping point where you know we we really developed a respect respectable industry and uh, from a brand perspective um, one that you know they're starting to create brands that will last you know for 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 a long time coming. Absolutely. Trevor, how about you? The Canadian market is very young still, but consumers know what they want. Can you maybe talk about the level of expertise and maybe sort of the wide range that you've seen in terms of brand new consumers coming in and people who are starting to give uh, the, the, the legal products a, a try? Yeah, so I mean, it's important to 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 put out there though, the Canadian uh, regulated market is, is significantly different. So we have a lot of numerous, uh, packaging restrictions and advertising restrictions. It always uh, warms my heart being in the US where you could see a billboard with a product uh, advertised on it because to me, that's an adult use product being properly you know, advertised. In Canada, we, we have a sort of view of it as, well, we should treat it like alcohol and an adult use thing, but it's actually more like tobacco. Um, so we don't have the same number of options. And, and for that reason, I think there's a lower level of brand awareness generally. So we see in our stores, we've got 86 stores across Canada. So it, it's actually really uh, nice to be on this panel because they're, they're very different perspectives on it, right? So for us, we have a lot of smaller stores and, and a broader geographic distribution. But what we're seeing is um, there's very little uh, brand resonance with people. So if you look at kind of a six-month churn, I think the only, there's only one brand it's pure sun farms bc uh, pink kush which is one that that typically cycles and we're very very data focused so we, we mine a lot of this data for insights and other than that though there's really not a lot of brand uh brand loyalty yet and i think that that's part of it when you come into a store uh, depending on the province you can't interact with the product right or we you know we've intentionally taken uh, an approach where everything has to be plain brown packaging so how can product companies really compete there, if it's brown package one or brown package two. But uh, we're optimistic that 
the U.S. example, particularly like Colorado, those early states, sort of showing us that, like, look, there isn't a harm in this. If it's done appropriately, uh, we're, our regulations are up for review next year uh, federally, and we're hoping there's going to be a little more uh, uh, loosening of that so that people can make informed product choices and we can do those exciting things that collaborate with producers. Now, Trevor, Fire and Flower has definitely created a vast retail network in Canada, but you guys recently announced plans for U.S. expansion. I'm wondering if there's anything that jumps out to you in terms of takeaways that you've learned in your time in the Canadian market so far that you're hoping will channel through or, or will become valuable once, once uh, U.S. operations uh, push through. Yeah, so I mean that uh, the Palm Springs location should flip over to Fire and Flower in the in the coming weeks, and so we're excited to, uh, that is coming, and that'll be a brand store for us. We can't uh, actually operate plant touching, but we do that through our affiliated company, American Acres. So we're excited to bring what we've learned competing in a hyper competitive market. So Alberta has one per eight thousand people, so it's similar to Colorado, but we also compete with our own government, ironically. So. So we're, we're really used to competition. And some of what we learned there is the value of customer service, customer loyalty programs, using tech to drive deeper customer loyalty and customer engagement amounts to higher basket sizes and customer lifetime value. So we're excited to bring those kinds of lessons to a market. Uh, it's, it's very exciting to see the number of products that are available in that Palm Springs store that are from a, such a diverse group of vendors. And, and we're excited to do things like product uh, partnerships, collabs, being able to actually just, again, do some simple things like advertise on billboards or simple things like you know, direct to consumer uh, e-commerce, <laughs> you know, branded cars, all that stuff is really exciting. So we're to, to take that next, next step. Absolutely. David, being in one of the busiest and most modern cannabis markets uh, to date, I'm sure that you have a good sense uh, from the store and management of that for when products come through and you know they, they catch a buzz or when maybe they don't pick up as quickly as they, as, uh, as, as they had thought originally. I'm wondering if you can share the ways that you have seen the product sort of hype evolve and transform into actual consumer interest and when you can tell this is really going to pick up or, you know, this, this, this is just not, this might not be, you know, this might not be as, as hot as we had thought originally or as the producer had thought. Yeah, so, you know, right now we're at this point where, you know, we are the largest dispensary in the world. Um, we see the most um, visitors than anybody does you know, see. Um, and, you know, we really dictate the sales within our store. And, you know, we're, we're going through an expansion from 40 to 80 register. Um, our, you know, our largest dispensary floor from 17,000 square feet is doubling. Um, you know, the scale in which we're, you know, operating at this location is, is like 10 other stores or 15 other stores, depending on how you look at it. So, you know, the brand exposure from just the amount of customers that you're seeing is, you know, the challenge for, you know, the, the, these these vendors and these brands is we we did the hardest part right we brought them to the facility we're mat you know we're we see you know thousands and thousands of people per day so for us you know we've done the hardest thing now from a brand perspective it's all about carving off a percentage of those customers to buy their products and you know it's competitive i compare us to you know um I would say, you know, Walmart, right? We share the risk with the vendor. Uh, we expect that, you know, we do um, also have, you know, slotting fees. Uh, we have packages within the store to make sure, you know, they're equipped to be successful. Um, but we have an algorithm to make brands successful in this store. And we put brands on a, on a global stage as people travel to Las Vegas, um, they, they, they remember those products. We have an experiential model. And, you know, not only do they take pictures at our facility, but they love taking pictures of their products and sharing that with their friends and family. So, um, you know, again, there's there's boxes that we have to check for us to, you know, consider bringing on any vendor within our store. But as long as those they check those box and do what they, you know, do what we've put together as far as making those brands successful, um, 
it's it's a slam dunk and it's 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 uh it's almost guaranteed at this point that you know they'll hit a certain level of sales and so um you know it, it's i come from a creative approach um as far as almost operating a, an agency within our uh our operation and we we do everything from helping those brands um with with uh social media photography um exposure within the store and outside the store and on our menu so um we've really dialed in what it looks like to have a successful product launch. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited where, uh, you know, some of that maturity of just, you know, that experience that we've been able to have with the amount of launches that we've done and very diverse products. You know, we have anything from a infused macaroon to a, you know, soda to a, you know, <laughs> uh, anything you could think of really, you know, we have here. And so, um, we've learned a lot and we've, uh, launched a lot of really cool products and we know kind of what works within our store and, and everything is a very, um, uh, experiential recreational, um, customer. And it's, it's just really important to know, you know, with your brand, um, what store is the right fit for you. And, uh, you know, we're in the re we're in the wholesale model as well. We have almost a 90% penetration rate in, in Nevada, um, but not every store is a good fit for us. And uh, it's important to know what synergies you have and uh, what's exciting for that consumer and, uh, you know, pair those up and it's usually a marriage for success. I see. David, I'm wondering if you can expand on the type of store. Do you have maybe a breakdown of how you see the different types of cannabis stores and you know, speak on that synergy or, or, you know, how, how do you recognize that when it, when it makes sense for, for a product to, to go with you guys or with someone else? Yeah. Yeah. So for us, it's, it's shelf, you know, shelf products are super important to be polished. And we, we have a, you know, the way we've displayed our store is, is a high-end retail model where um, we, we work with vendors and we have a visual merchandiser that builds out displays and does a lot of customization. So the product itself has to stand out um, to the consumer. Um, there's a lot of great products in the market that just have terrible branding and terrible, uh, you know, um, it's competitive in this location, right? You need to really stand out to the consumer. So, um, you know, that's one of the first things, but the number one thing that we say is the product quality has to be, you know, at, at a high level, um, at this location, it, that becomes an, um, an expectation. Um, they're not looking for, um, low end value products. They're looking for what is the best in Vegas? What is the best to offer? What is the best product I can have? And so we make sure we want to meet that demand. And, uh, you know, we not only have to make sure the product hits those metrics as far as quality, the packaging stands out, and they also do the proper marketing to make sure that customers are coming into Planet 13 and asking for these products, right? And that's the big thing we try to communicate with our vendors is make sure that they have the right plan, um, launch plan. We will do our part, you have to do your part. And uh, um, again, it's, it's the style. So, um, you know, some styles are, are value dispensaries, some are high-end, um, dispensaries, some, you know, sell a lot of edibles and some don't, right? And I think it's just knowing your geographic location, your consumer, the style of that consumer, and uh, really the, um, I guess, you know, what the opportunity is. Um, we, ha we have we have products that come to us that if they really dialed into the numbers, they're less than 1% of our sales, right? So to really focus in on a certain skew, it doesn't make sense for us because it's, will never achieve, you know, the level of sales that we need to out of that product. So um, just understanding, you know, geographic, you know, quality of product, does the brand, you know, relate to the, to the, to the retail brand and, um, and does it make up enough of the pie for it to actually move the needle and make sense for that dispensary to pick up? Wow. That's very interesting. Trevor, have you noticed that kind of store distinction in the Canadian market? Yeah, that that absolutely we have noticed. And so, you know, it's um, no secret that in December, we actually completed an acquisition of a, of a chain called uh, Friendly Strength here in Ontario. And that's a large chain. It's probably um, uh, uh, old school. So it's 25 year operating history. Just about Fire Flower being data driven is different groups of cannabis consumers that we uh, that Them are the types of consumers that all retailers would love to have in their store, right? So we focus on on serving those with the best possible uh, uh, service. What we noticed was that 
Fire Flower as a brand really appealed strongly to four out of those that say 10. And, you know, with some good marketing and rolling up your sleeves, you could probably get another one in there, but there's going to be certain parts of the cannabis demographic that don't, that our brand doesn't appeal to. And so we made a conscious decision to become a multi-banner uh, operator because just as, you know, cannabis is not just for one segment of the population, it, it cuts a very broad democratic sort of swath. It's, it's, uh, you know, we have a saying in Canada, that's 25% of the people that answered the government survey that said, yes, they consume cannabis. So, so that's probably a low number, whoever's answering the phone that day. But it's 25%, not just of one group, it's 25% of police officers, of doctors, of teachers, like it's, it's everyone. So really uh, for us, it was important to not have the one size fits all approach. So we have Fire and Flower as mass premium. Friendly Stranger is of course, again, much more uh, grassroots. We know that the customers there uh, skew older. They're not there, they're prepared to pay for it as well, the premium. We have another brand, another banner called uh, Happy Days with a Z, and that, that sort of skews much uh, with the smaller markets, and it is much more of a no frill sort of offering. So again, looking at the numbers and drilling into the data, it was important for us to address the largest possible market because we have a different model. We're sort of spread out uh, everywhere to service the broadest market possible. It was important to have different brands appeal to different customer expectations and experience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as a last thing, uh, I'm hoping both of you can share a little bit of the strategy and take us behind the scenes for the perspective of a retailer when a new product comes up. You know, we have a lot of companies that are putting out very exciting new types of products. In Canada, there's a lot of discussion about the potential uptick for beverages to really catch on this summer. Um, Trevor, maybe we'll start with you. You know, let's, let's, Throw the hypothetical. You get a call from 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 a partner saying, "We got this new, very exciting product. We want the the full red carpet rollout." What does that look like from your end? How does that process go? And take us through the steps of when a new branded product goes goes out into the market. Yeah, I think because of the market setup, it's actually much more important to do in store because that's really all you have. There's no external marketing. So we have a quarter of a million people in our Spark Perks customer engagement program. So that direct dialogue with the customer is going to be extremely valuable and important to product partners because we can have a direct dialogue. We can ask them, what do you, what do you like about this product? What don't you like? We control all parts of that customer journey. And also in store, you know, we started as kind of looking at what the best in breed retail was and then put cannabis in there rather than kind of the other way around. So we viewed initially things like Walmart, Target, Kroger's, they all view store as media. Like that's, that's next gen, current gen that way. And we took that very seriously. So all of our stores are very digitally enabled. And so, you know, what's gonna appear on the screen what time of day this product should be launched, what demographic we should be trying to go for to pre-launch this product or pre-seed that information. So it's, it's almost, it, you know, it's almost the reverse. It's really, really important to have a retail partner uh, in Canada for a launch because you, you can only really advertise uh, inside the walls of an age gated environment. So for us having that, you know, spark perks list is extremely important. Um, so we would plan with them all the way from pre-launch. It would also depend for us. We have a product velocity rating, like a power ranking for product turn and high velocity. We would set them up with a plan to how you need to get into the top, you know, 10, uh, you know, of, of store velocity so that you can predictably sort of rely on uh, inventory to replan. So we'd set them up with that. It would depend on who the producer was in terms of, like any other retailer, what their bench strength was generally. So it would be very different for sort of, a, I'm going to say like a, a micro grow or like a specialty grower to come in versus sort of an established uh, licensed producer that had a good track record with us of, of diverse product offerings that had always stood by us on price protection, all the normal indicia of a good retail partner. That gives them a, a sort of a power ranking, which allows them to, to access different parts of the store and different uh, parts of our, what we know uh, incontrovertibly is uh, what they think about this product is going to be hugely important because we don't have brands yet. People don't come in and say, well, I want Coke or Pepsi. And if you don't have it, I'm leaving because we don't have that, that person's individual attention to a product and product knowledge, the PKs are going to be tremendously customer purchasing behavior. 
course. Uh, David, over to you, same question. Somehow muted. There we go. Um, no our biggest thing with bringing on a product is the fact that the, you know, again, my buying team makes the decision, you know, is this product of the greatest quality, right? And we, again, we have this, these boxes we have to check, you know, upon that we do a launch package. Um, this is something that we put together uh, with a strategy session. Um, it's myself, my director of procurement, my marketing manager. It's really the whole team to make this a successful launch. We actually meet with their representatives. Uh, we, we spend about 30 minutes to an hour really strategizing, like, you know, how do we foresee this happening? Uh, we come in with a blueprint and really customize it based on their strengths and, you know, their weaknesses, right? Some people, you know, do not have quality social presence where we do and, you know, and, and we, we kind of fill those gaps as needed. Um, we're one of the only companies that I know of that actually has a full dedicated classroom and a whole training department, um, about five individuals that focuses on um, new employees, ongoing training, launches, the whole nine yards. So what we'll do the day prior is we make sure we have samples for the entire bud tending staff. Um, they have a full training session. It's an all day event. Um, we have about 100 and, uh, 20 butt tenders at this location specifically. Um, they go through the training one-on-one -on, -one on behalf of the vendor. We like the vendor's voice to be heard and you know they can explain what the product is, why it's special, and uh, we contribute and assist with any selling you know, uh, points and things of that nature. Um, and then upon launch, you know, we really focus on, you know, we do have a significant online ordering um, platform. So, you know, making sure the menu looks correct, the, the menu photos, um, you know, we have a text blast and email blast that goes out daily with, with specials, promotions, features, kind of a what's new type of thing for the day. Uh, we have, we have, a huge inventory that that just sits by their phones every morning at 9 a.m. and waits for that phone to ring. Um, so we make sure we feature them as well. Um, we have pop up presence in the store, and we also have um, about 50 different TVs within the facility where we highlight their product as it being launched in the store. Um, but again, this is this is a multi prong effort and approach. Um, we've done things where, you know, we, we have about 200 wrap cabs in the market, you know, in Vegas, and we've done things where we've done bigger collaborations, smaller collaborations, just what a launch looks like. But it's again, like, you know, I tell vendors all the time, like, you know, if you can dream it, we can do it. It's just, you know, how much, how much effort, how much time, how much money do we want to spend into this launch? And does it make sense for both parties? And uh, one thing that I've tried to, you know, be very transparent is it has to make sense and we have to set those goals um, ahead of the launch. And so we can look back a week after launch and say, is this, has this launch been successful? And what do we need to do differently, you know, to make this more of a successful product? So um, it's really structure of just, you know, bringing that brand to market. And again, making sure that brand actually has a fighting chance and that the category isn't, you know, extremely small um, within the store. So um, yeah, we've developed kind of a, again, a package that we, that we offer to our vendors and they can either want top of the line package where we get hands-on, they have all the, you know, the management executive of the teams to make sure we, we do a successful launch, or it can be as simple as, you know, we check in their product and it goes on our shelves and it competes head to head against others. So um, it could be as competitive as you, uh, as you choose from a, from a brand perspective. I see. That's fascinating. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank you both for your time and your expertise. It's been a great conversation. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Right. Don't Bye. forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more top expert interviews. For the Investing News Network, I'm Brian McGovern, and we'll see you next time.